If you work in the medical device industry, especially in design and development or quality or regulatory, I'm sure you're familiar with the requirements for risk management. And I'm sure in one way or another, you have participated in the risk management activities as required by ISO 14971, which is the international standard for risk management. But did you know that there are many mistakes people make, especially when it comes to risk analysis, that has potential to affect the effectiveness of the risk management process? Hi everyone, I'm Naveen Agarwal. I have practiced risk management in the medical device industry for more than 10 years. And I have seen some of these mistakes across the industry. And it's not that people want to deliberately make these mistakes, but these mistakes are happening and especially during the risk analysis phase. So in this video, I will share with you some of these common mistakes that I have seen in the risk analysis process that I think actually negatively affect the effectiveness of your risk management process. This video is part of my ISO 14971 basic concept video series because I know part of the reason why these mistakes are being made is because there's a lot of confusion about ISO 14971 requirements and some key concepts. And that is what I'm trying to do in this video series, sharing with you my perspective on some of these requirements so that you have a better understanding. So in this video, let's talk about risk analysis. And those of you who are familiar with ISO 14971, you know that clause five is all about risk analysis. Risk analysis has two parts. First, risk identification, which means you have to identify all applicable risks associated with your medical device. And second, you have to estimate those risks as part of the risk estimation process. So we'll talk about both of these parts and identify some of the key mistakes that I have seen uh, happen in the industry all the time. So when it comes to risk identification, pay attention to clauses 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4 in ISO 14971. 5.2 is about intended use and reasonably foreseeable misuse. This is very important and you have to do that very early in your design and development process. Intended use is also important from a regulatory perspective, right? We have to define the intended use. But reasonably foreseeable misuse is where I have seen some of the mistakes happen because we focus so much on use errors only. And sure, you can do usability engineering according to IEC 62366, and that's a good practice, but that is not all there is to reasonably foreseeable misuse. Two aspects of reasonably foreseeable misuse are generally ignored or not covered in as much detail as they should be. The first one is intentional acts of misuse, which means someone is not following directions, and it may not be that they deliberately want to cause harm. It's just that they think they have a better way. And the second part of reasonably foreseeable misuse that is generally not given as much attention is using a medical device for a purpose other than its intended use, which is also called off-label use. Now, both these parts of reasonably foreseeable misuse, you have to identify and estimate the risks associated with these reasonably foreseeable misuses. You may not be able to do much about them, but you have to acknowledge that a risk could occur because of these types of reasonably foreseeable misuses. Now that is where I have seen some deficiencies in the risk analysis process, and that leads to really not identifying all applicable risks that may be relevant. Now second area is characteristics related to safety. A common industry practice is to simply use that checklist of questions uh, now in Annex A of ISO TR 24971. Document that and move on. But those questions are not a checklist. They are meant to create a conversation, stimulate a conversation about identification of hazards and hazardous situations related to functionality or characteristics of your product that may be relevant from the safety point of view. Most people miss the boat on this because another outcome of this activity is identification of qualitative or quantitative safety limits associated with those characteristics related to safety. And generally, I have seen very poor documentation of those quantitative and qualitative limits. So what's the result? The result is that you don't have sufficient design inputs for your design control process. And your risk management process 
and the design control process are not connecting. They are not connecting. And that leads to maybe missing some of the relevant characteristics related to safety and risk control measures that you must implement. Now the third and I think the most important aspect of risk identification is identification of hazards and hazardous situations. And again, I have seen a lot of deficiencies and mistakes in the risk analysis process during the hazards and hazardous situation identification. And the most important reason why that is the case is because we rely almost exclusively on FMEAs in our industry for risk analysis. That's only partially sufficient, not entirely sufficient, because hazards and hazardous situations can also occur even when your device is functioning perfectly. So we get confused between the risk of failure and the risk of harm. And as a result, we leave out a lot of discussion about hazardous situations and hazards that are relevant from a risk analysis point of view. Finally, clause 5.5 is about risk estimation. And it involves two things, severity estimation and probability estimation of each risk of harm. So if we have not done risk identification appropriately and completely, the first problem is we are not doing risk estimation for all applicable risks because we are missing some of the potential risks. The second problem here is that if we confuse the risk of failure with risk of harm, we are not estimating the risk of harm appropriately because probability estimate is probably inaccurate. Another area where I've seen people make mistakes is not involving your clinical experts in assigning severity levels to each potential harm. Generally, it's done as a brainstorming session with engineers or maybe some people with some limited knowledge, but clinical input is often missing. And that is why your severity assignments may also be inaccurate. So let's summarize what we have discussed so far. Risk analysis has two components, risk identification and risk estimation. Some of the common mistakes during risk identification is not paying enough attention to reasonably foreseeable misuse. Not identifying characteristics related to safety in detail and not identifying qualitative and quantitative limits from a safety point of view. Another mistake is not connecting these characteristics related to safety and those limits to design inputs. And finally, relying too much on FMEAs for risk analysis leads to missing some of the hazards and hazardous situations when the device is performing fine, there is no failure. During risk estimation, the problem is probability estimates. And if we confuse risk of failure with risk of harm, our probability estimates are not accurate. For severity assignment, if we don't involve clinical experts with the knowledge of that particular area, then we are likely to have inaccuracies in our severity assignments as well. So these are some of the common mistakes I've seen across the industry. And again, I want to emphasize that it's not because people deliberately want to make these mistakes or they're ignoring something. These mistakes are happening because we really don't have a full understanding of risk management according to ISO 14971. That is why I'm making this video series. You can find other videos in this series as part of the playlist below. Now, if you're interested to learn more about this, I'm gonna drop a link for a free on-demand webinar you can watch about hazard analysis, which I believe is very important for us to understand in a little bit deeper way. And it'll help you to see why FMEA is not sufficient for hazard analysis. Finally, I will also share a link to the Let's Talk Risk newsletter, where you can learn more about these topics on an ongoing way. I strongly encourage you to subscribe to the Let's Talk Risk newsletter because you'll also become a part of a growing community of risk practitioners. And we can have a lot of conversation on an ongoing basis where we can learn from each other. With that, I wanna thank you for your attention and see you next time.